Welcome to Markinch St. Drossens and to Doors Open Day. Well, it's a very strange Doors Open Day this year because we're not going to be able to see inside the church. But as one door closes, another door opens. And we're going to see things today that are not generally available to the general public. Certainly not in Doors Open Day. Follow me. The building here is a 12th century building, that's the tower that you see in front of you. Uh, it replaced something that's referred to in one of Scotland's earliest charters. There was a church here as early as the time of Macbeth. But the one we're focusing on today is uh, an Anglo-Norman building of a very fine quality. Now why is it such a fine quality? We're going to try and find out when we go through the two doors that you see over at the tower there. Now neither of these doors is original. Originally the building was very securely defended. These were solid walls without doors. These doors were put in in the 18th century. But we're going to go through both of them and hopefully you'll see something that wasn't available to visitors on other doors open day, days in previous years. So as we pan up the tower past the 18th century doorway you can see a decorated strip. That would have been covered in a double row of diamonds at one time and probably brightly painted. Further up there's another row, a string course as we call it, and the three holes beyond that are for supporting the scaffolding. We come up finally to the belfry level where we have three pillars flush with the front of the building and then up above that we've got a, a bit of a mystery. It's a room that we'll look into later. So this structure here is the, the bellows which are still operating today making this one of Scotland's oldest churches that are still in continuous use. Now fortunately they're strong enough to stand on so I'm going to go up here and show you some of the clues that uh, we've come across a few years ago when we took the plaster off the, the walls and began to reveal what was underneath. We were absolutely amazed when a ceiling came down, a 19th century ceiling, to see this double arch underneath, more than five metres tall. We're going round the back of that later on and you'll see some of the, the more elaborate work on the other side. But this is totally unique, uh, an arch of this kind with two sets of boussoirs is what these things are called. Uh, and it would, must have been quite a, a, a monumental task to put that together. Now some of the individuals that were working on the project are represented by mason's marks on this wall here. As you can see, this wall is absolutely covered with a range of mason's marks, but there's one here in particular I'd like to focus in on. And that gives us a clue as to the quality of this building. The Master Mason had this kind of butterfly shaped mark. And on a stone that I'm looking at now, he produced a very strange symbol, which we couldn't interpret at first. And eventually it dawned on us that prior to this, Stones have been put together in Scotland at any rate in a fairly haphazard manner, but the Anglo-Norman master mason was specifying something very much like a brick wall, as we'd call it nowadays, or the half-bonding method. This was extremely strong because it meant that stones overlapped each other in a, a rational pattern and cracks were less likely to form in a building of this size. When we removed the plaster from the ground floor of the tower here, not only did we reveal marks made by the masons, we came across strange slots. There's one there and there's one there, which were 
originally the axle of a giant wheel. Now you can see from a medieval manuscript here how these wheels were used. Someone went inside them like a hamster in a cage, a rope was tied to the spindle, and that is what lifted the stones right to the top of the building. So that's the first clue. While we were doing this, something really quite extraordinary turned up in the graveyard. A stone which had been lying and which we had passed many times before, suddenly it became clear what that stone was. And this was a piece of Anglo-Norman chip carving. Not from this arch, but from the other arch at the other end of the building. So this is kept here in this mini-museum, as you see. And uh, we have things from other uh, phases or other uh, periods of the building. There's a very nice little uh, dragon shelf here. This would probably have held a statuette and of course it was ripped out at the time of the Reformation. And, and this in fact was found in a, a neighbour's garden. The other thing which is very uh, revealing when we took the plaster off, we realised there was a door here. It had been sealed up because the lintel had been cracked. There's an enormous crack in the lintel here. Now we think that happened at the same time as the door was carved or, or uh, struck through by the 18th century um, uh, builders. Obviously they had to fill it in because it was a structural problem and that meant that they had to build a door outside and we're going to go through that door now. Right so we're going to go through this door here which I think is a, an 18th century door. Now at one time the earth would have been up to the level of the door so in fact it's not a defensive door as, as was once thought. What we have in fact is an alternative to the block doorway that you, you saw inside with the cracked lintel and this was as I say probably late 18th century. Another thing that you can see from this particular angle is how narrow the church was in comparison with the, uh, the tower. The church was as wide as that. That's the edge of the old 12th century church. Okay, we'll go up to the top now and uh, we'll have a look at some of these rooms that were constructed in the first half of the 12th century. So here we are up on the first floor and as you can see it's quite a, a well lit room with a door at the side. Now this is a door as you can see from the side, no unauthorised entry, danger. And I'll explain why it's dangerous when we go through. But this again is a door that you've not had the opportunity to go through on doors open day before. Uh, so we'll go through this door and uh, we'll try and work out how this door in the tower connected with the nave, which is on the other side of this wall. So you can see all the different roof lines of the different churches that have been here right since the very first, which is the most steeply pitched one, which would have had a, a cross right at the top or a finial right at the top. As you can see, one of the raggles or creases cuts through the doorway that we've just come through. Now this is a later uh, roof line. The earliest one, as I say, being much steeper and above this. So the thing that's curious about this is that the most decorated side and the most expensive side of the door is on this side, looking towards the nave, not looking towards the door or towards the room that we've just come through. So why is this? Either it's because it was designed to be seen from below, from the nave, as I say, if the priest was here, perhaps showing the relics of St. Drosten or whatever as part of some ceremony, or perhaps it was connected with this being a domestic space that was used by the Earl or by the Macduff of Macduff when they visited to dispense justice. Certainly, there's something to explain here, and that gives you two explanations. I'm sure there are more. 
I did say it was going to be dangerous, right? Well, I'm standing right above the ceiling of the church, the modern church. And uh, if I put my foot this way or this way, uh, there could be an accident. But it gives you some idea of where we are. I'm looking back at the tower from the space above the old nave. And I'm looking at the doorway that we've just come through. So we're on level one. We're now heading upstairs to level two. And I want you to start asking yourself what the function of these rooms was, because that may well be the secret of this particular tower. So follow me to level two. So here we are on level two, and this happens to be the place where the mechanism for the clock is kept now. But another room and there are more before we get to the top and I think we're asking ourselves did a church need all this space in the tower or was there some other reason for building the tower perhaps it had more than one function so we're going up to the room above and we're going to have some impression of what the belfry stage looked like 900 years ago. So we're now up at the belfry level. Uh, the bell here is 19th century. And we're not even sure if there was a big bell here uh, back in the 12th century. It may well have been a handbell population of Mark Inch was not very large and it wouldn't have required uh, a, a large bell to call people to mass. So this room has many possibilities in terms of its use. If we look at the windows and the arches above them, they're designed to be seen from the inside. So it's quite possible that activities took place here which were not strictly related to the bell on the belfry. This could have been a scriptorium. The light is good for reading charters or even for writing. It could have been a vantage point uh, for hunting parties. And we do have a, a, a charter dated around the 1170s when the king's brother was here on a hunting trip. Uh, so possibly it could have been used for entertainment. Certainly it's a much better constructed room than you would expect in a, a normal belfry. Normally in any Anglo-Norman building the belfry is right at the top of the tower. But as you can see from this sign up here, a place where it's very much out of bounds we've got a room above this one so let's go up and see what might have been at the very top of the tower so here we are in the danger zone if you like at the top of the tower and uh, we're at the level of the four clock faces and they are driven by spindles here the question is why was this room so important that it was put right at the top of the, the tower? And there might be one or two clues here. But well, one of the mysteries at the top of this tower is this oval shaped niche that's been scooped out of the stone. So what was the niche for? Uh, difficult to say, but it was probably designed to hold something fairly valuable. And it would have been in behind uh, panelling and doors possibly uh, secreted within the panelling. Uh, we would have had either a bell there or perhaps even the bones of St. Drustin himself. What we have here are initials. Now, there's graffiti everywhere here, right up until modern days. But this particular piece of graffiti here is quite interesting. And it looks as though it's a dedication cross. The dedication cross you can see here. The initials, well, we don't know. We can speculate because it's likely that the very first uh, vicar, if you like, of, of, of the, the, the church was a man called Aeth, and he would have been known as Aeth the priest, Aeth Presbytero. So it's possible, but we can never prove it, 
that that was the original priest of the church dedicating it in the first half of the 12th century. Panning round, we have something that's a bit curious and to do with the construction of the building because we have a little image of a crane that looks like a modern crane, but in fact it's a, a hammerhead crane that was used in the Middle Ages and what looks like roof trusses being lifted. So is this a diagram that the masons put to show, put up in the wall to show others how the stones would be lifted or how the, the beams would be lifted? Again, we can't be certain because you can't date a piece of graffiti very effectively. And generally speaking, we have four windows here facing in four separate directions. Was this a lookout tower? Uh, and, and perhaps even more intriguingly, we have these holes here, which are the scaffolding holes that we saw from the outside, but they're also in the inside. So they were scaffolding outside and inside, probably using the same beams that went right through the building. Enormous logs that supported uh, the workmen when they were putting the inside stones in, as well as the outside. It's also possible, but not provable, that there was some sort of defensive wooden hoarding on the outside of the tower. But we'll be looking out for signs of that uh, when we do some of the later work in the project. So here we are inside the body of the kirk, way up in the balcony. Uh, probably the third balcony that there has been here, uh, two of them built in the 19th century and one probably before that. But this is a modern part of the church, but the plaster covers something that's much earlier. And if you can see from our recent archaeological work here, we've revealed the 12th century stone. And you can tell that by the diagonal hatching on, on the stone. Now this is the other side of the arch that you saw from within the tower. The voussoirs here correspond to the voussoirs at the top of the arch that you saw on the other side. But above them, there is something that you didn't have on the other side. And that this is this area here of very uh, disturbed and mutilated stonework. Now this has obviously been something here, a frieze of some description, that has been hacked off either after the Reformation or perhaps during the 19th century when the balconies were being put in. But we've lost the fine detail from this area around about here. What we're left with is two sets of voussoirs and there's another one underneath here and this cross. Now this is probably not one of the a piece of the official decoration of the church that has been put here unofficially by a stonemason perhaps as an act of ded dedication following the successful completion of the arch. If you look closely, it's got incorporated inside it the logo of the man that we think was the Master Mason. So we think that he has adapted his logo to make a croix pâté or a footed cross and he applied it to the keystone of the arch. Now you'll remember when we were up in the tower, we went through a doorway and I said that we were standing on top of the ceiling of the modern church. The door is actually somewhere behind the plaster here. And you can see this line here, which is what we reckon to be the line of the lower part of the doorway. So we have two theories here. Either the earl or the priest stood here and looked down on the congregation. Or if there was a, a floor in here, it would allow space for a complete chamber here, whether that was living quarters or storage quarters, we don't know. But until we remove the plaster from this area here, we won't really know whether there was a floor between the arch, lower down the tower, and the doorway further up the tower. Now the building was already quite ancient when Edward I came here in the late 1200s. He wasn't particularly impressed. In fact, his chronicler said that there is nothing here except the minster 
and three houses. But the use of the word minster is interesting here. It doesn't mean that it had a particular administrative function, but it does mean that it impressed the man that was writing the chronicle. And we can see why. If we're talking about a, a massive arch here, probably brightly decorated with an elaborate hood moulding over the top, the immediate impression of someone entering the building, combined with the scale and the loftiness of the, the, the nave itself, would have indicated that this was a building that was a cut above the ordinary. So you can see from this wider shot the scale of the building that was constructed in the 1880s. Growing population of Mark Inch, much more requirement for, for seats, and a Victorian church was, was built, uh, which was substantial in its day. But what I wanted to draw your attention to was down to that pillar there, because that is where the original church of Mark Inch is likely to have been located. And it would have been tiny. It would have either been made of wood, wattle, perhaps some stone, and perhaps there were several churches in that location. But when the uh, Earl of Fife built his Scotto Norman church, or Anglo Norman church if you like, he built something that was, that was much more substantial. Now I'm standing here in the nave, the balcony above the nave, and down there would have been a chancel. And around it would have been a chancel arch that would have been beautifully decorated. And if you remember that small section of chip cut carving that we saw in the tower, that is a decoration that we would have had on the, the chancel arch. After the Reformation, everything was changed. Everything was ripped out. The dragon that we saw was, was thrown into a garden. We had an interior decoration the like of which the building has never seen. And the pulpit replaced the altar, and the whole orientation of the church changed. The walls of the old church were pushed south, initially in the 1600s, and then in the 1900s they were pushed north, so the whole building was widened. Most of the doors to the church are closed today uh, for obvious reasons, but what I'm going to do is take you along some of the closed doors and take that as an opportunity to catch up on some of the, the history of the church itself. Now this door that we're standing in front of just now is the Balfour entrance and it leads to a balcony up above inside the church. It's been here since the 1600s and changed various times. But the Balfour family is a family that goes back a long way in uh, Mark Inch's history and uh, they're still very much connected with the parish to this day. We're now going to go and see a blocked doorway that goes back to the time of the, the Reformation. This entire wall was reconstructed uh, sometime in the late 1600s. Uh, the pieces of stone were taken from the old Norman wall and reinserted in this wall. And the original idea would have been that the wall was covered in lime wash, hence the, the messy stonework that you see in front of you. The doorway that you see here was the doorway that replaced the old Norman one and as, as you see, a very plain, simple Presbyterian outline. It's now blocked and has been made into a window, but you can still see the old hinges for the door uh, down the bottom here. We're moving on now to another door, which was quite important to the uh, Presbyterian church as it was created after the Reformation. Now you can see yet another blocked doorway. Now the boussoirs up here, you can see that there was a, a door here at one time and uh, we talked earlier about the chancel being taken away after the Reformation and a pulpit being installed here at the back of this wall. Well the minister needed 
an entrance, and this was the minister's entrance right up until it was blocked in the 1700s. Interestingly here, you can see a stone up at the top here, which has been taken from the old chancel arch. This is the chip cut saltire stone uh, that we saw uh, an example of when we were in the tower. This piece has been put here simply because it was a good key for the lime wash that was plastered on the front of the building. So we're moving off now to perhaps the oldest clue that we can find on this building. And I'll show you that above the next door that we're going to have a look at. So this door here replaces another door that would have been possibly six feet behind here in the old Norman chancel. It would have had a different lintel and there's a clue to that in the two stones that we see up here. They would be in the shape of an A, which was quite unusual in a Norman building. So the question arises, do these stones go back to an earlier church than the Norman one? And I'll leave that question hanging because at the moment we don't have an answer because we don't have a carbon dating and we don't have scientific information from underneath the floor of, of the building. Hopefully that will come at some time in the future. Here we are at the east end of the church and uh, what we have here is a, a, a building projecting from the church. Now that may once have been a mausoleum but later it's likely to have been a place where the tradesmen uh, gathered before the service and went in through an arched doorway inside this, this building. But the reason why we're round here is to point to something that was a bit of a mystery at first. There are a series of vertical grooves in the wall here and we couldn't figure out what these were until we realised they were arrow sharpening marks. The place called Bobat's about 200 yards from here and there was obviously practice taking place here probably on a Sunday afternoon uh, for the, 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 Scottish, the Scottish Army. The other thing worth mentioning while we're here is up at the top there, there's a shield from John Hepburn. He was a prior of the Priory of St Andrews who uh, looked after uh, the building in the 15th and 16th centuries. He was very keen to become made Archbishop and so he refurbished a number of properties in St Andrews and probably did a lot of work to Mark Inns Church in order to make it more attractive for the pilgrims because pilgrimage was on the decline when he was prior. So here we are around the north side of the building and what we have behind us, the brooch stonework here, is early 19th century, 1807 in fact, when this uh, side of the building is extended. And what you'll notice is that this stonework is still in quite good condition, but the later 19th century stonework, which is an extra uh, door into the church because of the increasing population, the stone that they used at that time was probably imported by rail and as you can see from the erosion here, much softer than the Markinch stone. So this is the last closed door for Doors Open Day. But it gives us a chance to speak about another of the great families of the area and that's the Leslies or the Leslie Melvers as they later became. This building behind me, and through these doors, was their mausoleum for many hundreds of years until they left the area in 1824. And that gave the congregation the opportunity to close all the doors on the other side of the building, to open this one and to have this as the main entrance to the church. Now it's difficult to sum up a project that's not yet complete, but already we're going to be able to say something about the patron who put the building together and about the individual masons that worked on it. It was clearly a prestige project 
and one that was very expensive. And it's likely to have been carried out by someone who was very close to the royal aristocracy, the very apex of Scottish society. We can narrow the likely builders down to four individuals, Earl Constantine, or his son Duncan, possibly Gilly Michael, who was his successor, uh, and a Macduff, of Macduff, head of the clan, or his son. When it comes to the dating, we're still working on that. But we've learned a great deal about the techniques that were used to put the tower together. And hopefully, next year, when you come back, we'll be able to look at some of these clues together. It's a building that was very close to the centre of Fife, uh, the legal centre where disputes were settled at Dalginch, directly in front of me over here, about 300, 400 yards away, and on the Pilgrim Way. Now that gave it prestige and importance, something that was ignored by modern day historians, and it's only gradually being realised that this particular building had a place in the history of Fife, and we are very keen to find out more about it. See you next year.